Welcome to Reading Around Macroeconomics. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and today's essay is a special treat. It comes to us from Michael Pettis, the economic historian, author, and professor of finance at Peking University for the last two decades. If you follow Michael on Twitter, at Michael X Pettis, you'll have noticed that for the last month, he's been referencing an article, and he does it by saying, the bezel matters. What is the bezel? What's, what's he talking about? We're going to find out today because we're going to read the original article. It's called Why the Bezel Matters to the Economy. And you can find it at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, as well as much of Michael's writing that goes back a decade. You could do a lot worse with your time. If you're interested at all in any of this, you could do a lot worse than going back printing out these blog posts and reading them. They're absolutely fantastic. They're still relevant today. Alternatively, I highly recommend any one of his many books. What is today's essay about? Well, let's ask Michael himself. Here's his introduction. The bezel, a word coined in the 1950s by a Canadian-American economist, is the temporary gap between the perceived value of a portfolio of assets and its long-term economic value. Economies at times systemically create bezel, unleashing substantial economic consequences that economists have rarely understood or discussed. Let's get into it. In a famous passage from his book, The Great Crash, 1929, John Kenneth Galbraith introduced the term bezel, an important concept that should be far better known among economists than it is. The word is derived from embezzlement, which Galbraith called the most interesting of crimes. As he observed, alone among the various forms of larceny, embezzlement has a time parameter. Weeks, months, or years may elapse between the commission of the crime and its discovery. This is a period, incidentally, when the embezzler has his gain, and the man who has been embezzled, oddly enough, feels no loss. There is a net increase in psychic wealth. At any given time, there exists an inventory of undiscovered embezzlement in, or more precisely not in, the country's business and banks. Certain periods, Galbraith further noted, are conducive to the creation of the bezel, and, at particular times, this inflated sense of value is more likely to be unleashed giving it a systemic quality. This inventory, it should perhaps be called the bezel, amounts at any moment to many millions of dollars. It also varies in size with the business cycle. In good times, people are relaxed, trusting, and money is plentiful. But even though money is plentiful, there are always many people who need more. Under these circumstances, the rate of embezzlement grows, the rate of discovery falls off, and the bezel increases rapidly. In depression, all this is reversed. Money is watched with a narrow, suspicious eye. A man who handles it is assumed to be dishonest until he proves himself otherwise. Audits are penetrating and meticulous. Commercial morality is enormously improved. The bezel shrinks. Galbraith recognized, in other words, that there could be a temporary difference between the actual economic value of a portfolio of assets and its reported market value, especially during periods of irrational exuberance. When that happens, Galbraith pointed out, there is a net increase in psychic wealth. Why? Because the embezzler feels, and is, wealthier, while the original owners of the portfolio do not realize that they are less wealthy. Think, for instance, of the many investors duped out of their retirement savings by Ponzi schemes, like that orchestrated by Bernie Madoff. In such situations, because the collective perceived wealth of the common and the asset's original owners exceeds their collective real wealth, for a while, the world appears to be a happier and wealthier place. As British economist John Kay later explained, The joy of the vessel is that two people 
each ignorant of each other's existence and role, can enjoy the same wealth. In this sense, the bezel is created not just by Ponzi schemers like Madoff, but also in the form of companies like Enron, for example, or WorldCom, whose accounting frauds resulted in overvalued assets and excessively high stock valuations. Until the accounting frauds are uncovered, there is a collective increase in psychic wealth as the value of the bezel rises. Unfortunately, the bezel is temporary. Galbraith goes on to observe, and at some point, investors realize that they have been conned and thus are less wealthy than they had assumed. When this happens, perceived wealth decreases until it once again approximates real wealth. The effect of the bezel, then, is to push total recorded wealth up temporarily before knocking it down to or below its original level. The bezel collectively feels great at first and can set off higher than usual spending until reality sets in, after which it feels terrible and can cause spending to crash. Part 2. Bezel Without the Embezzlement By itself, this was quite a useful concept, but in the 1990s, the vice chair of Berkshire Hathaway, Charles Munger, developed it into a far more important and subtle concept. The bezel doesn't need embezzlement to work, he pointed out. Any time the reported market value of an asset or portfolio temporarily exceeds its real economic value, by which he meant the value of future returns on that asset, the economy goes through the same increase in psychic wealth followed by a decrease, as he explained in a 2000 speech. Galbraith coined the bezel word because he saw that Undisclosed embezzlement per dollar had a very powerful stimulating effect on spending. After all, the embezzler spends more because he has more income, and his employer spends as before because he doesn't know any of his assets are gone. But Galbraith did not push his insight on. He was content to stop with being a stimulating gadfly. So I will now try to push Galbraith's bezel concept onto the next logical level. Munger went on to illustrate how rising asset prices, when they rise faster than rises in underlying long-term economic value, can contribute to what he now renamed the Febezel, a clumsy word that has never stuck. Munger's insight was that the rising stock or real estate prices can generate income and wealth effects whether or not these rising prices reflect real increases in the earning capacity of these assets, that is to say, in their real fundamental values. When they do reflect real increases in wealth, the increase in the investor's wealth is matched by an increase in the real productive capacity of the economy. There is no false or distorted sense of wealth. But when asset prices increase for reasons other than real increases in their productive capacity, something very different happens. The overall economy is no better off because there will be no corresponding increase in the productive capacity of that economy. The owner of such assets, however, feels richer, although only temporarily, because over the long term, asset prices eventually converge to a value that represents their real contribution to the production of goods and services. When the perceived value of assets outpaces their actual economic utility, the psychic wealth of the economy once again rises, and because this rise is not associated with any corresponding rise in real wealth, it is only temporary, though, as Munger noted, this temporary phase can go on for a very long time. The point is that financial markets can create temporary impressions of false wealth very similar to those of Ponzi schemes without any need for an embezzler. A notion, by the way, that economist Hyman Minsky would have quickly recognized as a restatement of the third Ponzi stage of his financial instability hypothesis. Part 2. The bezel can temporarily boost GDP growth. Unfortunately, as Useful as this idea is, 
mainstream economists, except for a few economists like Kay, have had trouble incorporating the idea of bezel into much of their work. Most economists exhibit this blind spot not due to any inability to recognize that market prices can diverge substantially from assets' fundamental value for long periods of time, but rather because they are unable to model a system in which market prices are not also the best estimate of the true economic value of an asset. More importantly, they find it difficult to accept the implications the bezel has on the way economic activity is measured and GDP is calculated, with the bezel distorting the relationship between economic activity and economic growth, mainly because, while the bezel is being created, there is no way to distinguish between real income and or profits and bezel-boosted income and or profits. Munger explained a very simple way this could happen, namely when rising stock prices need feed temporarily into rising GDP. If a foundation or other investor wastes 3% of assets per year in unnecessary non-productive investments, costs in managing a strongly rising stock portfolio, it still feels richer, despite the waste, while the people getting the wasted 3% think they are virtuously earning income. The situation is functioning like an undisclosed embezzlement without being self-limited. Indeed, the process can expand for a long while, feeding on itself, and all the while what looks like spending from earned income of the receivers of the wasted 3% is, in substance, spending from a disguised wealth effect from rising stock prices. That 3% per year that comes from the appreciation of the assets is converted into income, a process that is eventually reversed. Munger explained, when the reversal of the previous irrational rise in prices can no longer disguise the associated fees and wealth effects. There are other ways the bezel can affect GDP calculations. One way is through the commingling of real and speculative profits in business sectors in which buying and selling assets, such as land, commodities, and inventory, is part of normal business operations. When that happens, what should be recorded as a speculative rise in the price of an asset is recorded as an increase in operating earnings, which in turn increases the value-added component of the GDP calculation. Another way the bezel can slip into GDP calculations is by raising the market price of assets that in turn enable greater asset-based borrowing. As stock or real estate prices rise, for example, there is almost always a rise in household and business debt, at least part of which, by the way, is then plowed back into further raising prices. Yet another way the bezel can confound GDP calculations is by artificially lowering the cost of capital. When equity or debt has been bid to higher prices than will ultimately be justified by future returns, this reduces the cost of capital for businesses by effectively transferring a portion of the cost to owners of equity or debt. These lower capital costs encourage more commercial activity, including investment that otherwise would not be considered productive, and then otherwise might be justified. Such lower capital costs also feed into higher business profits, which in turn boost the value-added component of GDP calculations. Meanwhile, although these higher profits represent a transfer from investors because of rising because of prices rising above their real value, investors not only don't react to the transfers by cutting back on their own spending, but they actually feel richer, and so they tend to spend more than usual. Over time, in other words, GDP growth is artificially boosted by a rising bezel, which in turn is justified by rising GDP. The two elements reinforce each other in seemingly virtuous circle. Part 4. The bezel always reverses eventually.
But as Minsky explained, over periods of prolonged prosperity, the economy transits from financial relations that make for a stable system to financial relations that make for an unstable system. Because the bezel is, by definition, temporary, though it may last for a few years or even a decade or two, at some point the bezel will be eliminated and its elimination will reverse the earlier boost to the economy. When that happens, what appeared to be a virtuous cycle becomes a vicious cycle. Typically, this can occur in one of two ways. The first and most widely understood way is when a financial crisis suddenly reverses the mechanisms underlying the creation of the bezel, along with the debt creation that seems to fuel it. When that happens, the owners of the overvalued assets quickly and chaotically take large losses as the assets are written down. When John Mills wrote more than 100 fears ago, 150 years ago that panics do not destroy capital, they merely reveal the extent to which it has been previously destroyed by its betrayal into hopelessly unproductive works. He was effectively writing about the creation and subsequent elimination of the bezel within a credit cycle. But contrary to what most assume, the bezel can also be eliminated much more slowly as the gap between reality and the growth expectation implicit in the price of an asset is slowly amortized. When this happens, the losses associated with the bezel is effectively eliminated through, often hidden, transfers that force the loss onto one economic sector or another. Regulators, for example, may bail out the losers, especially if they threaten the banking system, and then they may either raise future taxes to cover the bailout or distort interest rates in ways that allow banks to profit artificially at the expense of depositors and borrowers, as the Federal Reserve did in the 1980s when it engineered a steep yield curve to help bail out the money center banks reeling from the Latin American debt crisis. Similarly, Chinese regulators in the early 2000s effectively amortized the bezel buried in the bad debt on the balance sheets of the country's banking system, which probably amounted to an estimated 30-40% to 40 of GDP. By setting deposit rates so far below nominal GDP growth rates that banks and insolvent corporate borrowers could, just by rolling the debt for 10 years or more, reduce the real cost of the debt by more than an estimated 50 to 60 percent. Those losses were recouped by the banks that had funded the loans in the form of very low deposit rates. In such cases, it is mainly ordinary households who pay for the reversal of the bezel, either directly through taxes or indirectly through repressed deposit rates or even unemployment. Unfortunately, the history of the bezel suggests that while ordinary households and workers absorb few of the benefits from the creation of the bezel, they tend to absorb most of the costs of its reversal. It is probably not just a coincidence that periods in which large amounts of bezel are created and then destroyed seem almost always to experience rising income inequality. In other cases, businesses and investors may suffer losses in low returns on assets for many years. When that happens, it is those sectors that seemingly benefited from the bezel who pay the costs of amortizing its reversal. What matters is that the bezel and its elimination will have real impacts on the economy that Galbraith identified only to a much greater extent than he imagined. While it is being created, the bezel boosts growth by commingling temporary speculative profits and operating earnings and by setting off false wealth effects and greater borrowing. 
The resulting financial mirage instigates higher levels of investment than can be economically justified and encourages more spending than households and businesses can really afford. In this way, a period of rapid growth can become a speculative boom. But while the bezel is being amortized, the opposite happens. Instead of artificially boosting growth when it is already high, this amortization depresses growth through the forced debt repayment and negative wealth effects just as it is, as it is already slowing. Notice that the cost of amortizing the bezel is proportionate to the, to the degree of psychic wealth the bezel had previously created. The more bezel that is created, the more painful the adjustment. Notice too how self-reinforcing the process of bezel creation and bezel amortization are. This, I would argue, is why investment and asset booms are almost always inevitably followed by busts or lost decades. Chapter 5. The Many Faces of the Bezel Clearly, Galbraith, Galbraith's bezel concept is most useful economically not when it is limited to explaining embezzlement and Ponzi schemes, but rather when it represents any substantial and persistent divergence between an asset's real economic value and its perceived value. Minsky argues that this divergence is most likely to occur in economies with rapidly growing debt, and it is certainly hard to find examples of countries with systemic tendencies to grow the bezel in which surging debt isn't also present. It might be helpful at this point to list the ways the meaning of the bezel has evolved and its various shades of meaning the term subsume. I don't like that. Let me read it again. It may be helpful at this point to list the ways the meaning of the bezel has evolved and the various shades of meaning the term subsumes. Outright fraud. First, the original meaning of the bezel. As Galbraith defined it, it is a fraud committed during the irrationally exuberant part of the market cycle before the victim detects the fraud. Imagine if Madoff, for instance, embezzled $100 from one of his victims. Although no wealth has been created, Madoff feels $100 richer while his victim does not yet feel $100 poorer. So their collective recorded wealth seems to be $100 higher. Of course, this illusion is only temporary. Once the fraud is discovered, the perceived wealth of the victim declines by $100. Asset Bubbles Second, however, it is important to note that not all forms of be bezel require fraud. The term second meaning, as Munger explained, is when the secondary market value of an asset temporarily rises above any meaningful economic or fundamental value. It is, of course, very hard to know, I a priori, exactly what the fundamental value of an asset is, as this depends on many factors, including predictions about future growth rates. But ultimately, the real economic value of an asset today is the value of the economic income associated with it over the rest of its life. In the case of real estate, this value could be approximated by the equivalent rental income minus holding costs. In that sense, the bezel is the gap between the a priori and the a posteriori values of an asset. When the market value of the asset today exceeds the value that it will generate in the future, asset owners will feel richer than they really are. Perhaps the classic case in real estate was Japan in the 1980s, when the total recorded value of all the country's commercial and residential property was equal to roughly four times the total equivalent value in the United States. For a while, until the 1990s when Japanese land prices fell by 85% during the decade, the total recorded wealth for Japanese households collectively was boosted enormously by the overvaluation of its real estate and further exacerbated by the overvaluation of everything from its stock market and golf club memberships to bark parking spaces and collectibles. <laughs> 
with land holdings at their peak comprising 65% of Japan's national wealth. But, as is always the case with the bezel, this sense of wealth was only temporary, even if it lasted many years before reversing. Once prices adjust, the wealth effectively disappeared. Bridges to nowhere. I would add a third variation on the bezel, which in some cases can be by far the largest source of bezel in an economy. This is when there is a substantial overinvestment in infrastructure or manufacturing facilities that isn't subsequently justified by the economic value created. Again, the most famous example of this is Japan's notorious bridges to nowhere, although China has increasingly become the most representative example of this third type of bezel, in which as much as half the growth in GDP in recent years may be a function of bezel creation. The way this works is straightforward. Some entity, usually associated with the government and therefore lacking hard budget constraints, spends, say, 150 to build a bridge or railroad that ultimately generates only 50 in additional economic benefits for the region or country. If the project were correctly valued, there would quickly be a $100 write-down of the investment, after which the total recorded or perceived wealth in the country would once again be equal to its real economic wealth. But if the ec entity that the but if the entity that built the bridge or railroad can continue carrying the project at cost, the collective recorded or perceived wealth of entities in that country is $100 greater than the real value of that country's economy, even if it takes many years for this discrepancy to come to light. This is likely to be by far the biggest source of bezel in a country like China, and one of the consequences is the extraordinary surge in China's debt ratios since the mid-2000s. If Chinese investment had been productive, meaning that if the value of the future economic benefits derived from investment were equal to or exceeded its costs, increases in investment might have caused temporary increases in national debt ratios. But these increases would have soon been reversed as the growth generated by the investment caught up with and exceeded the associated debt servicing cost. Yet, in the past 10 to 15 years, Chinese debt, Chinese debt has soared and even accelerated relative to GDP, which is itself overstated by the creation of bezel. And this suggests that a substantial portion of this investment is bezel. Inflated currency values. Fourth, bezel can also be created when speculative capital flows drive up the value of a country's currency to unsustainable levels, causing those who earn income in that currency to feel temporarily richer, a feeling that can then express in the form of higher consumption of foreign goods and more travel abroad. Any instructor at a fashionable ski resort in Europe or the United States, for example, can tell which currencies have recently risen most in value by noting which country is sending an exceptionally large number of visitors. Overpriced collectibles. Finally, it is possible that certain assets whose value is not a function of their contribution to the production of economic goods and services like very expensive art or collectibles, also creates an impact very similar to the bezel during the times of rising prices. K expressed a similar point when he argued tongue-in-cheek that the critic who exposes a fake Rembrandt does the world no favor. The owner of the picture suffers a loss, as perhaps do potential viewers and the owners of the genuine Rembrandts gain little. Part 6. Why the Bezel Matters to Economics Minsky argued that one of the reasons mainstream economics seems to do such a poor job of explaining modern economies, 
was a tendency among economists to ignore money, banks, and balance sheet effects. But these elements should correctly be placed at the heart of economic analysis, he argued, and this meant, among other things, understanding how balance sheets created and destroyed value and how they lined up systemic, pro-cyclical, and counter-cyclical tendencies across an economy. Galbraith understood this, as many, if not most, professional investors and traders intuitively do. Galbraith's put bezel is an artificial value that emerges from the ways in which balance sheets interact with speculation and create forms of money and value. But while the bezel is created independently of the underlying operations of the economy, like many other balance sheet effects, it can modify and in turn be modified by the operations of the real economy. K makes the point forcefully. The essential story of the period from 2003 through 2007 is that banks announced large profits and paid a substantial share of, their, of them to their traders and senior employees. Then they discovered that it had all been a mistake and more or less wiped out their shareholders and used taxpayer money to trade their way through to new levels of reported profit. The essential story of the period from 2003 through 2007 is that banks announced large profits and paid a substantial share of them to their traders and senior employees. Then they discovered that it had all been a mistake, more or less wiped out their shareholders and used taxpayer money to trade their way through to new levels of reported profit. The essential story of the Eurozone crisis is that banks in France and Germany reported profits on money they had lent to Southern Europe and passed the bad loans to the European Central Bank. In both narratives, traders borrowed money from the future, and then the future came, as it always does, at turning the bezel into a bummer. From large amounts of an increase in psychic wealth provided by the systemic creation of bezel to turning the bezel into a bummer. Understanding the role of the bezel in economics means understanding that it has at least four important consequences. First, the bezel represents recorded or perceived wealth that does not exist as real wealth productive capacity, and as such, it boosts collective recorded wealth above real economic wealth. This discrepancy gooses GDP growth in at least three ways. One way this happens is that bezel creates a temporary wealth effect that boosts consumption and investment spending to a level higher than where either normally would have been. A second way is when part of this false wealth shows up either as higher income or higher profits for the entity that benefits from the boost in recorded wealth. A third way is when rising market values collateralize increases in borrowing that are then used either to raise prices further or to increase spending. It is not a coincidence that GDP growth rates are always higher than expected in periods during which a great deal of bezel is being created. Second, the reverse is true when the bezel is directly or indirectly recognized and amortized as it must eventually be. One or more sectors of the economy, households, businesses, local governments, farmers, or banks, must absorb the loss. As they do, the wealth effect reverses. Their, their lower earnings or profits are reflected in lower than expected GDP figures, and they are forced to pay down the debt. Just as it is not simply a coincidence that bezel is created mainly during economic booms, nor is it a coincidence that it tends to be recognized during economic downturns or financial crises. Third, bezel creation seems to be systemic. There are periods, in other words, when it seems that the operation of the financial system errs toward creating bezel. 
and these times always seem to be followed by periods in which the bezel is automatically wrung out of the system. Fourth, as Galbraith especially pointed out, the bezel has a self-reinforcing impact on growth in either direction. When it is being created, the illusion of wealth tends to reinforce growth and encourage the creation of more bezel. When it is being amortized, it tends to inflict additional costs of financial distress on the economy, especially to the extent it was financed by debt. Chapter 7. Bezel Booms and Busts The bezel cannot be quantified, and it cannot even be proven to exist until after the fact. But while that makes it useless as a concept for a form of economics that values precision over accuracy, this doesn't mean that its impact should be ignored. The balance sheet matters, and when there is a significant, significant, albeit temporary, divergence between the perceived value of assets in an economy and their future contribution to the production of real goods and services, whether this divergence is created by fraud, irrational exuberance, or malinvestment and other forms of non-productive investment, this divergence will change economic behavior and activity in ways that are not sustainable. This is especially likely to be the case when an economy is locked for many years into the systemic creation of bezel. When that happens, the economy will experience a period during which economic activity overstates the real underlying growth in productive capacity, followed by a period in which this overstatement is illuminated. I hope you enjoyed that piece. I know I certainly did. As I said at the introduction, I do recommend you go to the Carnegie Endowment for an International Peace and look for Michael's blog, which is called China Financial Markets, and go back in time and check out those pieces which stretch back a decade and will still be relevant today. Lots of good points. I, perhaps if I was just to pick out one, it's that Michael makes the point that this bezel, this qualitative fact that cannot be picked up quantitatively has no room or cannot be found in modern economics. I mean, it should have room. That's his complaint. It should be in there, just like Minsky said. And also, for those of you who follow Jeff Snyder's work, isn't it the same thing? Michael here was saying, you know what's not in modern day economics? Money, balance sheets. And what does Jeff always say? What is modern money? but the bank's balance sheet capacity. So a lot of overlap from completely independent points of view pointing at the same thing, which is that economics, modern day, it's sort of failing us. It's not capturing that which is real, which the traders, right? The market makers, the people that are in markets, the speculators know is intuitively there. Somehow it never made it into into the economic models that our current central bankers and established economists are operating from. And it wouldn't be a problem, would it? I mean, if they were in their ivory tower, but guess what? They're not in their ivory tower. They're in positions of power. They're on our television sets, in our radios, and in the institutions that are supposed to be managing money. So we are all affected by it. Hope you enjoy this, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.